Welcome to the show and thank you for tuning in. On April 19, 1995, 20 years ago this week, a man in his late 20s named Timothy McVeigh detonated a fertilizer bomb destroying the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building. Shortly thereafter, he was apprehended by an Oklahoma state trooper during a routine traffic stop. And in June of 2001, after a controversial series of legal proceedings, McVeigh was executed by lethal injection. For a few brief months, this would remain the most catastrophic and most recognizable act of terrorism on U.S. soil. But decades later, two decades later, questions about the Oklahoma City bombing remain, uh, not just in the minds of uh, people on the fringes of the mainstream media, but also for relatives of the victims, some federal investigators, and even some people who were implicated in the attack. Here are four of the unanswered questions. Number one, how many people participated in the conspiracy leading to this attack? And mind you, this is not a theory, this is an actual conspiracy, in that people participated in secret to do this thing. The question is, who were these people? Because you'll see in the original reports, there are descriptions of John Doe's. The first John Doe is typically thought to be Timothy McVeigh. The second John Doe, however, that's a very different story and it still hasn't been positively identified. There are a couple possibilities. There's Kenneth Michael Trentadu and then there's Richard Lee Guthrie Jr. Remember those names because they come into play later, especially in the second unanswered question. The suicides associated with this event, there are two that people will tell you are at the very least suspicious. One of the first of these was a police officer named Terrence Yeeke. Now Terrence was a hometown hero during the events of the bombing. He was about four blocks away. He was the first police officer to respond. He rescued several people and he wasn't, you know, a braggart. He wasn't super arrogant about this. In fact, uh, the rumors on the street or were that he really refused to have too much contact with the people he rescued because he was just doing his job. On May 8th, 1996, he was discovered in a field. Uh, what people believe happened was this. Apparently he attempted to slit his wrist and his neck, climbed over some barbed wire into a field where he shot himself, allegedly. He died from a gunshot to the head. This was ruled a suicide. People who don't buy the official story believe that Yiki had some sort of insight that would contradict the official narrative of the bombing. Second, Kenneth Michael Trentadu, one of our potential John Doe number twos, died in federal custody. However, the medical examiner called to the scene refused to agree that this was a suicide. The body was covered with bruises, cuts, looked like it had been beaten beforehand, and the examiner didn't believe that these were self-inflicted. Another person who didn't believe this was Trentadu's brother, uh, a practicing attorney named Jesse Trentadu. And Jesse will also come into play later in the story. Three, a familiar name that you might remember from the initial proceedings is a guy named Terry Nichols, who uh, helped McVeigh build the bomb and assisted McVeigh with a couple of other pieces leading up to the bombing. But uh, according to him, he didn't know exactly what was being planned. And we're probably not going to find out all of Nichols' side of the story because According to him, he's been repeatedly denied access to journalists, to sending outside mail, it's been interfered with. He contacted the lawyer we just mentioned, Jesse Trentadu, because he said that he had proof or uh, evidence or he had testimony that there was a high-ranking official of some sort directing McVeigh toward this attack. Now at this juncture, we should point out in all fairness that it is not uncommon for people who are imprisoned to uh, seek outside help and to say that they have more information that didn't come out at the time of their original trial. This happens often with many sorts of convicts and many sorts of crimes. Fourth, and perhaps the most disturbing, uh, concerns the ATF and the FBI, and this leads into this whole who is the high-ranking official that this Terry Nichols guy is talking about. Well, 
at the time, the ATF and the FBI, despite being arms of the same government, were at loggerheads. They were not friends. Their communication was very poor. And this has led people to wonder if there was a compartmentalization of information where, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So this is a valid question. How much did the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms know about the possibility of an impending attack? And how much or how little did they tell the FBI? For people who don't believe the official story of the Oklahoma City bombing, one of their unanswered questions would be, why were there no ATF agents injured in the attack if the ATF was the target of this attack on the Murrah building? There is some stuff that happens uh, early in the news cycle about this event that muddies the water here because there were claims that two agents were injured, then there were claims that four agents were injured, one agent was apparently injured in an elevator shaft. However, uh, one of the relatives of a victim of the attacks uh, delved into this a little bit deeper with the help of an investigator and they contacted the elevator company who said that story just wasn't true. The elevator company checked everything. There was no elevator in free fall. There was no one injured in a shaft. It didn't happen. And this story disappeared from the news. So within this realm of allegation, these allegations of a cover-up, we see two sort of uh, diverging theories here. And one of these diverging theories is that there was a cover-up after the fact of bungling, right? A cover-up of a, a lack of communication due to departmental rivalries or agency rivalries, which is possible. But the second idea, and perhaps the more disturbing idea, ties into what we've been covering this week. The idea of a false flag operation. The idea that someone or some faction in the U.S. government worked purposefully to have an attack like this take place, or like you will see in our earlier episode on, is the FBI manufacturing terrorist uh, somehow put these people, put McVeigh and the people he was in contact with uh, in touch with the techniques, expertise, and equipment that they would need to successfully carry something like this out. At this point, it's unknown if these questions will ever be answered to the satisfaction of the people raising them. And uh, we have to say that legally, like in the official U.S. court system, uh, they have ruled that Timothy McVeigh was responsible with the help of Terry Nichols, maybe not knowing entirely what he was getting involved with. Uh, but as far as they're concerned, that is a case closed situation. What do you think? Do you think that the official story of the Oklahoma City bombing has been told in truth or in full detail? Is it uh, the truth told slant like that old Emily Dickinson poem? We'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And we'd like to hear if you have any other unanswered questions about this or other terrorist events. Do you think it was a false flag? Do you think that these ideas of false flags are just fear mongering and sensationalism? Toss us a like, uh, subscribe if you haven't yet, share with your friends, and if you would like much more information, then check out this week's audio podcast on the Oklahoma City bombing over at stufftheydontwantyoutoknow.com.